What an amazing text of scripture uh, that the gospel brings us today, uh, worthy of a sermon in its own right. But I do want to focus today on the story of Jonah as we uh, step into this time of racism and anti-racism. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Jonah was not a heroic prophet. He was a complicated man with some serious commitment and anger issues. Nevertheless, God chose Noah, Jonah, excuse me, for a mission. When we first meet him in the first sentence of the book which bears his name, Jonah, the son of Amittai, is called by God to go to Nineveh and to testify to the people there so that they might turn from their wicked ways and live. Jonah responds by fleeing the opposite direction and heading to sea. Apparently, Jonah believes that God's power is limited to the land. So he's wrong. God's power is extended to the sea as well. At sea, a storm blows up and threatens to sink the ship. While Jonah sleeps, the sailors each pray to their own individual gods for help. Finally, the sailors decide their ship must be cursed, and they decide that throwing Jonah overboard is the only way to save their ship. They are right. The storm settles as Jonah hits the water and is swallowed by a big fish. Not Jaws, because he's never chewed, just swallowed. Probably something more like a whale, but we know this as the big fish. In the belly of the big fish, he prays for deliverance and he writes poetry. The praying prophetic poet gives the big fish indigestion and the BF spits him out on the shore. Only then does Jonah realize he should probably do what God commanded him to do in the first place. So he heads to Nineveh to spit out his prophetic pronouncements. He goes to the center of town. He declares, if you don't turn around, if you don't repent of your evil ways, God will utterly destroy you and your animals. I've often wondered if the people turned around because of their own wickedness or because they love their animals so much. But be that as it may, within 40 days, they turned around. It turns out this complicated man is the most effective prophet in biblical history because the Ninevites listen to him. They literally turn their lives around, save themselves and their animals from the wrath of God. But rather than rejoice in the effectiveness of his prophetic word at the turned around Ninevites, Jonah gets angry. He would rather have seen them destroyed. Obviously, I think he was looking for like a 3D game version of wiping these guys out. He is mad that God has accepted the repentance of the Ninevites, even though that's exactly what God sent him on the mission to do. He is so mad about the Ninevites turning to God, Ninevites turning to God that he goes out of the city, builds himself a little shelter, takes refuge there, and then God puts up a little shade bush for the pouting prophet. God decides to destroy the shade bush during the night while the prophet is sleeping and pouting, and that just increases his pouting and his rage. Now, Jonah is beside himself. God says, you can't be serious. You are angry when I destroy the shade bush which I created, but you don't care about more than 120,000 Ninevites and their animals who didn't know right from wrong whom I saved through your word. You are one messed up dude. That's my translation. God rebukes Jonah's foolishness and honors the Ninevites' faithfulness. 
God's grace is magnified, the wideness of God's mercy is extended further than anyone, especially his own prophet, could ever imagine. In the end, God prevails and Jonah misses the point. The book ends with our graceful and merciful God reconciled with the city turned around and not with our heroic prophet who we leave at the scene still angry. In summary, the prophet is a mess and the previously messed up ones are not a mess. Turning around matters. Acknowledging what is wrong and changing course really matters. Ninevites break the mold of sinfulness and lack of self-awareness. The prophet misses the point and is disappointed by God's grace and mercy. In the midst of all this, hope is re-established in a once great city. And the storyline, as we see, gets flipped on its head. The seemingly righteous prophet is all messed up, and the seemingly unrighteous wicked ones are all straightened out. Throughout this story, choices are being made. Choices to run away from reality and try to hide from God's call. Choices to get out of the belly of the fish and face the truth. Choices to call people to accountability. Choices for those called to accountability to change. Choices to forgive. Choices to be merciful. Choices to be angry. Choices to be confrontational in honesty and truth-telling. Choices to blame God for God being graceful. And choices to do the right thing. As I was reading the book of Jonah and preparing for today, I couldn't help but see the story of race and racism in America and how it interacts with this story of God's prophet Jonah. That may not sound like the natural connection that you would make to this story, but I see the challenges of race and racism as our own flipped on its head reality. Those of us who present ourselves as all together need to take a good hard look at ourselves in relation to race and racism. And those of us who are deemed racist and a lost cause need to get it together as well. We need to turn around and accept that God will forgive us and we need to get going the right direction. There are two recent books that I highly recommend that look at race and racism in America in black and white ways, literally. The first is written by Dr. Robert Jones, entitled White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity. And the second is by Ibram X. Kendi, entitled How to Be an Anti-Racist. Now, Robert Jones is white. Actually, Robert has taught here and met with us on other books that he's written and has interviewed me and has been a part of my life for many, many years. But he is white. He grew up as a Southern Baptist in the Deep South. As he says, I had a Confederate flag on my car as a teenager, and it's the first thing I put on there. As the CEO and founder of Public Religion Research Institute and a former Ninevite, he has researched and written about religion and politics for the past 20 years. This book draws from history, <clears throat> public opinion surveys, and his personal experience, which is very compelling. Robert is not afraid to confess his own place in this story, nor his family's long history to this story. He concludes, white Christians, including Catholics, all Protestant denominations, all Protestant denominations, Orthodox, Pentecostal, and Evangelicals in the United States have actively built and sustained white supremacy since before the nation's founding, constructed institution and theologies that uphold racism to this day. Jeez, Jones writes, white Christians have not just been complacent nor complicit, but rather, as the nation's dominant cultural power, we white Christians have constructed and sustained a project of perpetuating white supremacy that has really framed the American story from the beginning. And the legacy of this unholy union still lives in the white Christianity of today. 
Jones, recounting the history of white supremacy in the church, writes a lot. Prior to the Reformation, he says, Catholic theologians concocted a thing called the doctrine of discovery that they said, in which they said, white Christians had a divine mandate to occupy lands that were not Christian, which legitimized centuries of colonization, enslavement, and genocide against indigenous peoples in places such as the Americas, Africa, and Asia. This doctrine was enshrined as a papal bull and issued by Pope Alexander VI in 1493. Later, during the 18th and first half of the 19th century, Catholic and Protestant slave owners in the United States twisted biblical stories to suggest that black people were inferior while simultaneously claiming enslaved black people uh, should follow their Christian duty to do what was said of, to them by their slave owners. They also brought enslaved people to church with them, forcing them to sit in the back or in a specially constructed gallery separate from white worshipers. Jones writes, what kind of gospel could be preached in that setting? What kind of liturgy could be practiced? What kind of hymns could be sung? He says of those times and the enslaved people and their enslavers attending worship together, then you really see that from the very beginning, white Christianity developed around this prior commitment to a white supremacist status quo and that it has carried that way forward for us. White supremacy pervades white Christian institutions up to this day. For nearly all, for almost all of American history, the light-skinned Jesus that was conjured by most congregations was not just indifferent to the status quo of racial inequality, but that light-skinned Jesus demanded its defense and preservation as part of the natural, divinely order of things, writes Jones. Churches are still highly segregated. Dr. King was famous for saying in the 1960s, on Sunday morning, we are the most racially segregated any time in America. And he's not far off in the 2000s as well. As of 2012, four-fifths of American churches have a single racial or ethnic group that comprises 80% or more, and mostly more, of the population. And 11% of American churches are still 100% white, according to the Pew Research Center. Now, we need to know and to reconcile our history. We need to examine our language, our liturgies, our music, our preaching, our teaching, our organizational and leadership structures, our mission, our ministry, our very souls. This is not somebody else's business, this is our business. Like the Ninevites, we need to turn this around. In the words of Robert Jones, there needs to be a reckoning. For all who are white Christians, we need to name, to claim, and confess our parts of this wickedness. We need to repent, and we need to ask for God's forgiveness for our part in this history and this moment. I know that for some, this idea of confessing and turning around is not only repugnant, but they would say, not necessary. No problem, Reverend Tim, I got it all together. I'm sure, like the Ninevites before us, when the more than 120,000 Ninevites repented and turned around, there were more than a few in the crowd who thought they didn't really need to do that, but they'd go along just to make the others happy. Either they thought they were fine and didn't need to confess, or they simply loved the Ninevite privilege they gained from the perks of living in the city of sin. In spite of the self-assured Ninevites who loved and benefited from Ninevite privilege, there still ended up being a complete turning around. It takes everyone, not just a few. But turning around is only the beginning. We need to keep after it, and that's where we turn to the great writings of Ibram X. Kendi, who writes about his own confession of being a racist and turning around as the first words in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. His opening chapter is My Racist Introduction, in which he tells his own confessional so story 
of his own racist mindset, writings, and actions as a teenager against black people as a black teen. He then goes on to write his book as a training manual for all of us facing and dealing with racism, which is all of us. I invite anyone who is listening to pick up the book and read it. Come join our book study on Monday nights or Wednesdays in the morning. We are looking at this for the next six weeks. So how to be an anti-racist gives us definitions and language to assist in climbing this mountain of absolutely necessary change. It is essential to have words that clarify the problems and solutions to the problems. Like Jones, Dr. Kendi uses history, research, and his personal experience and his family's story to show us a better way. Unlike Jones, Kendi is African American. He grew up not in the Deep South, but in New York and New Jersey, and now teaches in Washington, D.C. The first two definitions he offers in the book, and there's lots of definitions, are racist and anti-racist. A racist, listen carefully, is one who is supporting a racist policy through their actions or inactions or expressing a racist idea, similar to what Mark was talking about in the book today. He or he, uh, Kennedy puts the emphasis on the marriage of racist policies and racist ideas. As an anti-racist, you are one who is supporting an anti-racist policy through your actions and expressing an anti-racist idea. Anti-racism is a choice. It is also defined by action. For example, when you say, that I favor education and housing for low-income families, and particularly persons of color, that we have equality in those areas, but you do nothing, then you're a racist. You'd like to be an anti-racist, but you're doing nothing, so you're still in the racist column. Racism flourishes with the inaction of people. I'm gonna repeat that. Racism flourishes with the inaction of people. Kendi goes on to clarify there's no place or no category in the world in which he's describing for someone to say, I am not a racist. And by the way, the people who say that loud enough and more often than the others are my most suspect cases for racism, by the way. We need to choose to be an anti-racist or choose to be and continue to be a racist. That's his point. That's very liberating. The history of our nation and of our families and each of our lives, no matter if we are white or black or brown or a glorious mix of all, is packed with finger pointing at those we call racist and claiming we are not racist and then lacking action by most of us to be anti-racist. This needs to end. The only way to end this pattern of inertia is to make a choice. Are you a racist? or are you an anti-racist? Once you've made a choice, Kendi helps unpack this choice through his differentiation of dueling consciousness and power and biology and ethnicity and body and culture and behavior and color and class and space and gender and sexuality and more. He continues to present definitions and delineations so that we understand what our choice means. Through it all, we all have choices to make. Am I a racist or am I an anti-racist? Will I stop talking about others and pointing at others and critiquing and criticizing others and, examine, and, and failing to examine myself and my place in these times here and now? Or will I change that direction? Or will I continue on as though nothing matters at all? Let me put it this way. Will each of us examine ourselves and turn around like the Ninevites did so long ago when faced with a choice between redemption or extinction? Or will I claim, like Jonah, to be pure and sinless and obviously messed up, even though I don't know how to really defi define that for myself and get angry and sit on a hillside, well, there aren't a lot of hillsides, but sit on a higher ground outside of Columbus and pout 
and throw temper tantrums and point fingers again and again and again at everybody else, at God and that other woman and that other man who are not doing the right thing and don't fit our idea of what looks right in this world. So we can change ourselves and our society or we can scream and pout. Personally, I choose to follow the example that God sets an example of grace and mercy and forgiveness for me and everyone else, I choose to develop and implement anti-racist policies and practices. I choose to be an anti-racist and turn things around. I hope you join me so that we can take this journey together. Amen.